<laughs> okay, so what's lean manufacturing? So he says it's a production method. Method. Designed to re to reduce time, reduce time yeah. and increase efficiency. I don't know how to spell efficiency, but that's close enough. You guys know what I mean, right? Is that what lean manufacturing is? So reduce time 
increase efficiency reduce waste is that what lead manufacturing is yeah i couldn't hear you increase productivity Yeah. Can we call waste unnecessary stuff? Okay. Yeah. Minimize. Is this what lead manufacturing is? So I don't know that I would have used the word method. But I think I know what you mean when you're using the word method. Um, so when I think of a, of a production method or a manufacturing method, I think of stamping or CNC machining or yeah. but that was that wasn't exactly what you meant right it's more of a instead of production I want to I could I could use the word method if I change the word production to say management because we're we're managing the production and so if we call it a management method or a management system, I think it, it flows better off the tongue. So lean manufacturing, who, who had heard of lean manufacturing before this class? Who's taken a class in lean manufacturing here at WPI before this class? No, your hand was sort of up. Uh, you're industrial engineer, you will take a class in lean manufacturing if you haven't yet, if you're in industrial engineering. I think there's five industrial engineering courses that either have lean manufacturing in the title of the course or in the course description. Um, lean man so it's a, it's a management method designed to actually reduce wasted time if you could do something faster, then the extra time you're doing it is wasted time, right? Right, does that make sense? So we are trying to reduce time, but we're trying to reduce the wasted time and we're trying to minimize the value added time, right, to the minimum thing, because any time we spend doing something that takes longer than it has to is wasted time. So we wanna reduce time the reason we want to reduce time is because we're trying to get a lower cost. Now, we introduced manufacturing economics last week. What did we say the purpose of, well, when we introduced manufacturing, we said manufacturing was to make stuff with the intent to sell it, right? Last week, we talked about the fact that most of the stuff that gets made with the intent to sell is made by businesses or companies. And those companies, in order to continue to exist, they need to have a profit. And we defined profit last week. What was it again? Anybody remember how we defined profit last week? Yeah. So value minus cost. And then we talked about the first derivative of profit with respect to time is profit rate because we're engineers, we're not mathematicians, so we're not going to do all those mathy things. We're just going to divide by time. And if we wanted to make um, better decisions, we might make our time units smaller. 
right? We might look at smaller time units there, but uh, but profit is value minus cost. And so pretty much everybody that talks about lead manufacturing focuses on cost. And, and we'll see as we talk about this, that most of the lead manufacturing tools are targeted at reducing cost. But our real objective is to increase profit or even really increase the profit rate, increase the rate at which we make a profit. That's, that's better, right? Oh, then we could do the second derivative. It would be the acceleration of profit. No, you could do that. It's all math. It's a thing. So we want to increase the rate at which we make a profit. So if we reduce cost and value also goes down, that doesn't work then, right? So lean manufacturing is a management method or a management system that's targeted at increasing profit, typically by reducing cost without impacting value. All right, what else? All right, so that's, we, we've said, what is lean manufacturing? But I gave you, what, three, four minutes to Google it and learn everything you could about it. What did we learn about lean manufacturing besides what it is? Who learned something about lean manufacturing besides what it is? I said, learn everything you can about it. Yeah. There are a bunch of different types of wastes that we can minimize to minimize cost. There are many types of waste. Yeah, go for it. So unnecessary transportation. Transportation. We talked about that last week. Yep. Keep going. Overproduction. Idle time. Not Billy. Idle time. Defects. Um, this one seems to be pretty similar to unnecessary transportation. So how much inventory is the correct amount of inventory? This is excess inventory. We're especially, if we care about profit rate, it's not enough to just say how much you can sell. Uh, it's like my... Um, Anybody collect stuff that they shouldn't collect? I don't mean like sports cards and things that have future value maybe, but I mean just like junk. Like you can't resist keeping stuff around. Yeah, my, my grandfather used to say, this will come in handy if I never use it. And so I, I inherited that too. And I won, at one point in time, I had four basements and two attics full of junk. All junk that I owned because I didn't throw it away promptly. Um, and so if we make stuff that we could eventually sell, we have to keep it somewhere for a long period of time. So I, I like your answer, but I just want to get a little bit more detail. It's how much could we sell in before we could make more? That's how much inventory we need to have. So how much are we going to sell before we are able to make more? The ideal amount of inventory is zero because all inventory has cost. And so if you can make something 
because the customer ordered it and ship it to the customer and get it to the customer at the time that they want it, that's a, that's a much better situation than having a warehouse full of stuff. Anybody ever work in a warehouse? You, you have? Yeah, I, I worked in a warehouse um, through, I guess, my last three years of undergraduate here at WPI and then for about the first six months after I graduated. And um, we made, anybody ever bought something made out of plastic at Walmart? Or staples, some organizing sort of thing, like the thing you put on your desk to like, like they have those trays that you put on your desk for like incoming and outgoing. Who's ever bought one of those? Who's ever actually used it? Really? Effectively? You can have all of the ones I've ever purchased. Anyway, I worked for a company that made stuff like that. We made uh, fake milk crates, like those milk crates that you put your books in, you move them in and out of dorm rooms. I'm sure you have some. They were probably made in the factory where I used to work in the warehouse. So we did an inventory in the warehouse. And... Um, came up $3 million short of product in the warehouse. This is plastic crap that sells for like $1.69. $3 million short. Inventory is expensive. That was just stuff they couldn't find because people would leave the back door propped open, take a whole bunch of stuff out, and then go sell it at a flea market. Maybe they should have paid their employees more, I'm not sure. Um, anyways, so yeah, inventory is expensive. So any inventory is excess, but sometimes you just can't make it fast enough to fulfill the customer need. So sometimes you have to have some, um, underutilized talent. That's a, that's a cool one. That's a cool kind of waste. So you hire really smart people and then you let them just sit around. That's underutilized talent. You, you have people with skills that you're not using their, their, their skills to the, uh, the correct level. Um, and so you mentioned that transportation and motion sounded like the same thing. So transportation is more like moving the stuff from this factory to this factory because we have some of the machines over here and we have some of the machines over here. So that's more what they mean when they say transportation or moving it um, like with a forklift from one side of the factory to the other side of the factory. That's what they mean when they say transportation. Motion is more like we put our part in the milling machine and we do some operations on this. And then we take it and we flip it over and we do some operations on this. But I, I had to pause the milling operation in order to flip the part over. So you guys are making the, the base for the Sterling engine this week and last week. And so you had to flip the part over. So it's that flipping over that they mean when they're talking about motion. How could we make that part without having to flip the part over? Right, because it's unnecessary motion. Well, is it, some of it's necessary, right? You need to access both sides. So unnecessary motion, but could we make that part without having to flip the part over? Yeah. Rotating table. So you could have it on a table that flips over itself, but you still have to hold on to it. What else could we do if we wanted to to make that part without having to flip it over? We could redesign it so all the features can be made from one side. Right? That's something else that we could do also in addition. Now that the design is kind of on the design engineer. But at the same time, the design engineer should be thinking about how it's going to be made if they want it to be able to be um, not wicked expensive. Um, all right, so overproduction, overprocessing, making features the customer doesn't care about, spending time to get a surface finish on the part that the customer doesn't care about. Um, yeah, overprocessing, transportation, overprocessing, idle time. You got that right. Standing around, not doing anything. 
like like the like the three minutes after I was all ready to start lecture today, but I was waiting for it to be the time to start lecture. If we were trying to optimize, I actually would have gotten ready three minutes slower or started getting ready three minutes later so I could have been doing something else instead. But that, um, so that idle time, but also what, what other idle time do you see in the processes? When you're using the CNC machines, what other idle time happens? That's not just because you're standing around waiting for it to be your turn. Tool change. So during a tool change, you're not adding value to the part. Now, you, it's a required waste, right? So there's, there's really two different kinds of waste at the highest level. There's required stuff you have to do that the customer doesn't care about and not required. All right, so there's, you have to change the tool in order to use the other tool but what if you could make all the features with one tool? Then you don't have to wait for the tool change. However, that one tool might have to run significantly slower. So you may not get a benefit. So I think if we took a, um, an eighth inch end mill that had a long enough depth of cut, uh, so the AP1 there, if it had a long enough AP1, we could make that entire base bottom part with an eighth inch end mill. But, oh, when I, uh, when I bought my first machine shop, we, uh, the only piece of furniture I, I put in the office was a bed. I mean, this is, there was other furniture that just sort of came with the office. Um, but uh, even though the office was a mile from my house and it took 15 minutes to get back and forth, those 15 minutes were important when you had the machines running all night long and you were the only one taking care of them. I used to set an alarm clock to wake me up when I knew that the program was gonna be over. Never once did I need the alarm clock. The spindle would stop spinning and I would wake up, go out in the shop, flip the part over, press the start button, go back to sleep for another two hours. And I did that for a couple of years. Um, what were we talking about? Idle time. Oh yeah, so tool changes. So, and that was because that was as fast as we could run that tool. We would have run it faster if we could have. But uh, so the reason we don't use that little tiny eighth inch end mill is because one, it can only step over an eighth of an inch at a time for each pass. And it can only cut down an eighth of an inch at a time for every pass. Otherwise it'd break because the cutting forces would be too high. Um, and it can't move very fast. So the bigger the tool you have, the bigger the tool is, the faster you can go because it's going to be stronger, right? We talked about that and we talked about forces and strength. So you got to factor in, is that tool change necessary? But what can we do? Make the tool change faster. So the, the mini mills you're using, they, uh, when it calls up a tool change, the, the, actually the, the table moves out of the way. The spindle moves up, the table moves out of the way. The spindle comes back down, the tool change carousel comes over, takes that tool out, then it rotates to the tool that it wants. And it comes back down, it pulls that over, and then it moves the table back in place. So they make, so that's called an umbrella tool changer. So they make a thing called a side mount tool changer, where it's sort of got a similar carousel, but it's mounted sideways instead of down does a couple things for you. It gets the tools out of the table area so that you don't have all these tools hanging down that your fixture might run into when it goes to that direction. But the other thing it does, it allows it to rotate to where the next tool is before it calls a tool change. So they, they look ahead in the code and it rotates to where the next tool is before it calls a tool change. And it's got this arm that grabs the tool that's in the spindle and grabs the tool that's going in the spindle and it switches places and it puts them away. And it does what we call random warehousing of the tools. So the tool that came out goes in the spot where the tool that is going in came from. And so you can do that to speed up the tool changes. You don't have to wait for the rotation thing to happen. And then the, uh, the mill drill center, which we didn't use here. So the other thing is the time it takes to get from the tool change location to the workpiece. 
we really like to have a lot of clearance between the tool change location and the workpiece so that we could have a bigger workpiece next time. However, the further away it is, the longer it takes for the tool to get there to start cutting, right? So the, uh, the mini mills, they go 600 inches a minute, full speed rapid. You guys knew that? We talked about that before. We have a uh, machine tool in, uh, in Washburn 108, that's a mill drill center, 2,000 inches a minute, full speed rapid. And that, that side mount tool changer, it moves so fast that if there's a chip on the tool when it grabs it, it doesn't stay attached. It spins around and the tool goes, well, it makes a loud noise when it hits the other side of the machine. Um, so you gotta be really careful or you slow the tool change down if you think it might happen. Uh, also, if the tool's heavy, it has a problem. Uh, I, I mentioned we did a MQP a couple years ago with a large uh, manufacturer that's here in Worcester. And uh, they had seven different machines all making the same part, running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all making the same part, had seven different cycle times. And, and so the, the purpose of the MQP at first was just to figure out why do you have seven different cycle times? Because they're all running the same G code, the same program, all the same manufacturer, all the same model number machine. Well, it turns out that the, uh, the motors that drive the X and Y axes and the Z axis, those are servo motors. The way servo motors work, there's some tuning involved that talks about how fast they accelerate and decelerate. So all the machines had different acceleration times. All of the, not all the fixturing was exactly the same. So some of them had to go further to get to the part. That's why they had such a big reach in that. Um, anyway, uh, defects. You guys understand why defects are wasteful, right? Okay, so these are some kinds of waste that we want to eliminate in um, lean manufacturing. Does any of that add value? No. So all of this is about cost, right? What else did we learn about lean manufacturing? Besides there's seven different kinds of waste. Anybody? Because there's five classes about lean manufacturing at WPI. Yeah. It means that you end up running your margins a little bit tighter. Like your warehouse isn't gonna have as much stock in it. If something bad happens, you might not have any product that you can actually sell. Um, so reducing inventory could be costly because you might run out of product to sell. That's what you're saying. Um, yeah, it's a management decision. That's why we, that's why I say it's a management method. It's not a manufacturing method. Who else uses lean manufacturing besides manufacturers? Anybody know? So one of, the, one of the big places we see people implementing lean manufacturing is in the medical industry. Who's ever been to the doctor's office? Who's ever seen waste at the doctor's office? I don't mean like biohazard waste and medical waste. I mean like wasted. Who's ever had to wait for the doctor? Yeah, I had a, I had a checkup a couple of weeks ago with my primary care physician. And uh, of course, they tell you to be at your appointment 15 minutes early because you can't have the doctor wait for you, right? And so when you get there, they've got a board of all the doctor's names that are in the office. And there's like a red light or a green light next to their name to say who's on time and who's behind. But then if you look at the caption, up to 20 minutes late is considered to be on time for the doctor, <laughs> right? And so, so, and so that's, that's expensive. Healthcare is especially expensive in the United States. We all, we all have experienced that, heard about it on the news, everything. And so one of the things that they're trying to do is reduce costs in healthcare. So they're applying lean manufacturing techniques, especially in hospitals and large uh, physicians' offices, things like that. But is it really because they want to reduce cost? So, so if they can reduce time, they can get more throughput and they, they, they can have more revenue. So they probably will end up with more profit at the end of the year. So yeah, they absolutely want to do that. That's why like when you go to the dentist, there's another place 
there'd be like three people in a dental chair and one dentist going from room to room because you're in different stages of getting ready for the dentist to show up, right? So they're trying to get throughput through. But what else, what's the, um, what are the major causes of death in the United States besides dying? Dying is the, the largest cause of death, I think. Maybe. Yeah, because typically our heart stops when we die. So a lot of a lot of deaths are ruled cardiovascular. But yeah, yeah, we have we have a big problem with cardiovascular health. That's a topic of a whole different lecture. Um, I think it's it's number two or number three. I'm not sure what the number one is right now. It could be car crashes. Yep. Did yeah, but they attribute everything to heart disease. Yeah. Yeah. Accidents and stroke. You know what you don't see on there is oh accidents, right? Who's making the accidents? A lot of times it's the doctor. So so actually, um, and it, the mistakes in hospitals is a major cause of death, which may not be on the CDC chart. Um, the kind of mistakes that get made is misdiagnosis, um, misapplication of medication. So you give somebody a medication that they're allergic to, things like that. And so they use these lean manufacturing techniques to try to systematize so that things like that don't happen. So it's not just about um, it's not just about reducing cost or increasing throughput. It's also protecting value to make sure you don't lose the value because the real value of going to the doctor is that you don't die. Right? That's that's our purpose for going to the doctor. Maybe. Maybe you don't hurt is a secondary value of going to the doctor. So don't die, don't hurt. Um, I think that's pretty much why we go to the doctor. Uh, so, all right. But lean manufacturing, so those are the goals of lean manufacturing. One of the things we try to do is we try to reduce waste. How do we reduce waste? Anybody know, anybody see where the, the term lean manufacturing came from when they Googled it? So, yeah. Uh, Post war 1950s, 1960s. Post war 1950s, 1960s, so World Japanese War II. Automobile Japanese automobile company, Toyota. Uh, this, uh, uh, first formulated. First uh, formulated. Uh, the, 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 what, waste of superfluous. Of big words. Somebody in Wikipedia is trying to show off <laughs> with their with their use of big words. So um, so what we call lean manufacturing came to the United States by a couple of guys that went to study companies like Toyota, and they watched what the Toyota people were doing. And Toyota had what they called the Toyota production system, and uh, and these guys said this is so lean as in like not fat, right? The opposite of fat is what we're talking about lean. And so these guys, they, uh, a couple of consultants, they, they wrote a book about the Toyota production system and they coined the phrase lean manufacturing. So we, what we call lean manufacturing is based on this Toyota production system. The idea of the Toyota production system was to eliminate waste from the process so that they could um, make more profit or actually just not go out of business at the beginning, right? Not be bankrupt. So when, uh, when Dr. Toyota was interviewed by a reporter and the reporter asked, where did you come up with the idea for the Toyota production system? So is everything, oh, and you know, all like auto manufacturers, all companies in the U.S., they, we all pay lip service to the idea of lean manufacturing. The, there's a pretty common job title of lean implementer or lean instigator. And any, any company over $20 million in revenue has one. And uh, all, the, all the car makers are doing it. So when they asked Dr. Toyota, 
where did you come up with the idea for the Toyota production system? He said, I read Henry Ford's book. So our companies copy Toyota who copied Ford. He actually studied, he went to Ford factories and studied how they did production, how they did things there. Oh, I'm sure he had, he was a pretty smart guy too. So we had this Toyota production system. <clears throat> one of the, uh, one of the major tenants is, um, is this idea of just in time manufacturing. So this idea of reducing inventory. Inventory is one of the most expensive kinds of waste that we see in, in uh, manufacturing. Um, and so for the, for the reason that I talked about the warehouse I used to work in $3 million short of inventory. So it, it, it gets lost. It gets damaged. It costs money just to keep it, even when you're not losing it or damaging it. So, uh, so one of the things they, they do is if you can coordinate the operations very well, you could have your, uh, your Toyota Camry chassis going down the moving assembly line at the Toyota factory. And at the moment when the chassis gets to the spot where the seat goes in, on another conveyor, the seat that goes in that car arrives. And so they arrive at the spot at the right time. So they didn't have to have a big stack of seats next to the place where they install the seats because the seats arrive just as they need to be installed. So, or the door or the um, whatever it is, the component that needs to be installed. So that, that requires a lot of coordination. What, um, what I've, uh, in all the automakers try to do this. We were there. I was at the, um, I was at the airport. I think it was Lamister, Fitchburg. And um, every 45 minutes or so, there was a Learjet landing, pickup truck backing up to it, people loading stuff from the jet, pickup truck, drive away, Learjet takes off. And um, ask him, what's going on? So it was a factory in, uh, in the area up there that was making components for GM for a seat belt to go in some car that was in production. I don't remember what the car was. And it took them about 45 minutes to make enough parts to fill up a Learjet. And they were contractually obligated to deliver them. There was no time to put them in a truck and drive them to Detroit or wherever the factory was. So just-in-time manufacturing can be expensive. Um, and what happens if, if the car gets there and there's no seatbelt? What do they do? <laughs> um, well, so when the car gets to the spot where the seatbelt goes in, there's two things you can do. You can skip the seatbelt and you can have the, the car get all fully assembled, but without that component. And if you do that, you make a little note, right? You take a Sharpie or write on the windshield. This car has no seat belts or something like that, right? So they go out there. And, uh, and then all those cars go to a special parking lot by the factory. And then when the seat belts finally do show up, a mechanic goes out to that special parking lot and goes and installs the seat belts. That sounds expensive. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of car manufacturers will do it that way. They just keep, because you don't, if what happens if you stopped production and waited for the seatbelt? Yeah. All the other processes stop too, right? It's not just the seatbelt guy that can't work. It's everybody in the whole factory that can't work. And so one of the other things that's made Toyota and the TPS really famous is the, the fact that all over the plant, there's little pull cords that any employee can pull. And what happens when any employee pulls any of those pull cords is the production line stops. And so when you get to like, you go to put it in, maybe it's not even that you don't have the seat belt. Maybe the, the nut or the bolts are cross threaded. So the, there's a problem with the hole and you can't put the nut in to fasten the seat belt in. What you do is you pull the, they call it an andon cord. You pull the andon cord, the whole factory stops. And there's like a flashing light that says, hey, this guy over here is the one that stopped everything. Flashing light, right? 
Who do you think happens at that moment? Everybody pays attention to fixing your problem. And so they come over, like, what's the problem? Oh, well, I can't put the bolt in the hole because the threads are messed up. So well, the, then you immediately repair this one by getting a tap and fixing the threads. But also, you go immediately to the place where the threads were made, and you find out why they're messed up. And you fix that problem immediately so you don't make a whole parking lot full of bad cars. Occasionally, if it's going to be too hard to fix the problem, they'll let a car go through just like all the other manufacturers do. But they don't have a big parking lot. They have five parking spaces. And if there's five cars that are not correct, they stop the whole factory till they fix the problem. And so this is why Toyota has a reputation for having high quality vehicles, right? We, we've all heard that. I mean, all, all of them make mistakes, right? But um, so that's one of the primary things is lean manufacturing. So yeah, we want to eliminate waste. But one of the really important things that we want to do is we want to empower the employees. And so the, the power to stop the whole assembly line, that's kind of a big deal, right? At, at most car manufacturing factories, it takes an executive decision to decide to stop the factory, but you can make a lot of bad cars before the executives finally decide, right? So that's one of the things. All right, so lean manufacturing really though, besides the idea of it, and the idea sounds kind of like common sense, right? Would anybody not think that we should eliminate waste? do things the cheapest possible so we can make the most profit possible. We all think that that's common sense. Um, common sense, I guess, typically isn't very common. But um, there's a lot of different tools in lean manufacturing. If you were to Google lean manufacturing tools, you'd come up with a bunch of different lists. Uh, because we base a lot of this on the Toyota production system, there's a lot of things that we use Japanese words when we talk about lean manufacturing. It makes us feel like we're cool because we're using Japanese words, it's the only reason. Did we speak Japanese? No? Perfect. So if I don't pronounce it correctly, you won't, you won't know the difference. Um, one of the big things that everybody that talks about lean manufacturing should know is called the five S's. The five S's. Anybody know what the five S's are? Anybody heard the term five S before? All right, so we've heard the term five S before. I've got a slide here. Let me get my slides back open. I've got a slide that shows the five S's. Oops, not that one. This one. You guys can look at all those things. Here's five S's. Any guesses what the five S's are? Oh no, scrounge, steal, stash, scramble, and search. Oh wait, no, those are the anti five S's. Who's ever had to do any of those things while trying to finish a project? Yep, especially if you're in a, in a, in a dirty facility, right? Especially if you're in a place where nobody ever puts anything away, right? So when you need the tool, you got to go find it. And so you scrounge around to find it, right? So you go to the, maybe you go to the, the machine area next to where you're working. You open, anybody watching, you open the drawer. Oh, oh here's the calipers. Here's the drawer. Go back over to your work area. And then you use the calipers. And then you don't turn them off so the battery is dead for the next person. It's the bane of my existence. Um, so what was your what was your list instead of these? So sort instead of scrounge, let's sort. So if we sort, then we know where stuff is. Yep. Yeah, sustains down at the bottom. Standardize. Shine. One, two, three, four. That's only four S's. Set in, set in Set in order. Yeah. 
So sort, find it. Put it where it belongs. Shine, standardize. So if you have five of the same work areas, make them all be the same. And then anybody could go to work in any work area and they know where the tools are. Standardize and sustain. That means keep doing it. Put the stuff away when you're done. Now, there's actually five Japanese words, which coincidentally all also start with the S sound. And I don't remember what they are. You could look them up. It really doesn't matter. Coincidentally, they all translate to words that start with S also. I think the fix is in. Ish. I think so too. Uh, oh, the remanufacturing understand value and waste. Use the tools to help. Is my haiku for today. All right. So there's a bunch of there's there's tons of other lean manufacturing tools. Um, one of the most important things is put the tool put the tools that you need to use to do a job near where you're going to do the job. Think about the path that stuff. Oh, and if you need a tape measure at two locations, buy two tape measures. Put one at each location so you don't have to go back and forth. I could. How come the screen share went away? I think I closed the tab. That's why. So for um, for homework today, for the uh, we'll do a, a class participation quiz for today, and it'll be to look up look up and describe five additional lean manufacturing tools that people use. So you can't use 5S um, and you can't use just-in-time manufacturing. Uh, and I'll, I'll put this on the assignment as soon as we're done here. But that'll be the, uh, the, the participation quiz is to go find out five more lean manufacturing tools that we didn't talk about here. There are thousands of them. You can get a, uh, a black belt in lean manufacturing. You can take five different courses, five or seven. I can't remember what the number is. There's a lot of courses at WPI that use lean manufacturing as part of the title or the uh, course description. It's used prolifically in, well, companies say that they use it. One of my former students, he actually got a job at a Toyota facility. He had a, so he had a master's in manufacturing from WPI and a master's in management from WPI. He was like my lean manufacturing consultant. When I had lean manufacturing questions, I asked him questions. And I get paid as a consultant to go teach companies how to do lean manufacturing and to, to um, assess their, their leanness. So I'm pretty smart about lean manufacturing, but I always go to Tim to learn more. He went to go work at a Toyota facility and uh, his job title was year end a, you know, production line changeover manager or something like that. So he was in charge like when the model year ends and they changed the stuff in the car. He was in charge of making sure that next year's cars actually look like next year's cars and not last year's cars. Um, and he used to complain all the time about how not lean Toyota was, right? But, but lean manufacturing is based on the Toyota production system. So everybody says that they do lean manufacturing. You will see as you get into industry that, that things are not as lean as they could be. And there's always room for improvement. And, um, and that's actually one of the other things that we talk about in lean manufacturing is you need this continuous improvement. You need to always be assessing, are we doing it the right way? Can we make it better? Can we reduce cost more, minimize more waste? Those things. So that's um, lean manufacturing at 50,000 feet.
maybe 47,000 feet. Lean manufacturing at 47,000 feet at, um, I don't know, at about 0.8 Mach. 45,000 feet, you can do that in a Learjet. So maybe 0.7. So that's it. See you guys tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.